Janice Bedain. I am the president of the League of Women Voters of Western County. Boy, we're still having trouble with that, huh? Hello? Can you hear me? Okay. Sorry, we had this problem at the NID forum and we kind of went back and forth, so let's just cut to the chase here and move to this. Um, again, my name is Janice Bidet and I'm the president of the League of Women Voters of Western Nevada County and I want to thank all of you for coming out tonight um, to hear about our candidates for sheriff. This is the second time that we've hosted these two characters behind me. Um, we did it once uh, also in the primary. Um, I want to set, extend my thank yous to all of the League of Women volunteers, particularly Doug Bianchi over here, for um, all of the organizing efforts that go into this. It's not uh, a simple thing. It actually takes quite a bit of um, work, so thank you to them. I also want to say thank you very much. I really, truly mean this, you guys, to the media. They just show up every time, and it's a long night for them after a long day, and they every single time they're here, and really appreciate your participation, it's important. Um, want to thank all of you for coming out. And then I just want to also mention that uh, tonight we are also really lucky that we have both NCTV and KVMR broadcasting live tonight. And uh, these organizations are doing a whole lot to make sure that everybody in Nevada County uh, is an informed voter because there are lots of people who cannot, for one reason or another, make it to something like this, but they can listen. They can listen tomorrow or the next day. They can watch. They can watch on the YouTube a week from now. Um, it's really a vital service that they're supplying for us. So um, I want you all to consider little donations to NCTV and KVMR every once in a while for the good work that they do. Before I turn it over to our moderator tonight, I just also want to say that out on our table, the League of Women Voter table, there is some really good information. Uh, the League of Women Voters, um, uh, both the local league and the state league, have been doing a lot of work to make um, to create several voting tools that make it easy for voters to do all sorts of things online. So if you visit our website, which is www.lwvwnc.org for League of Women Voters Western Nevada County, you would be able to click on a button to register to vote. You could click on a button to check your registration status to make sure that you are already registered if you believe that you are and make sure your information is correct. You can also click onto something there called Voters Edge. Voters Edge is an incredible voting tool um, which allows you to type in your address and your particular ballot comes up. So you can do that right now before our ballots have even dropped. And then in addition to that, um, the, the candidates, uh, if they are participating, and we are really working on our, all of our candidates, and I believe both of these candidates are participating, um, but we're trying to get everybody from, you know, the, the senator level down to the school board level to um, give us information about themselves, who they are, what their vision is, so forth and so on. So it is a great way, and particularly for those of you who get that call the night before ballots are due to say, who do I vote for for school board? And I'm sure many... I just, uh-oh, okay. Um, you can say go to Voters Edge because it's all there. So this green piece of paper right here tells you all about Voters Edge. And take it home and check it out. It, it is really, honestly, I think it's going to really revolutionize um, the way we get information out to voters. And then this blue, um, this blue paper tells you what you can do on our website. You can also learn more about Voters Choice, which is the new way that we vote in the county. We have gone through one cycle. It was very successful. If you want to know more about it, we have a link to find out about that. So I think um, the last thing I want to say is that next week is the end of our series, and we are uh, not presenting candidates, but we are presenting the pros and cons of all of the ballot measures that are going to appear on your ballot, and there are many of them, and they're oftentimes difficult to understand. So uh, one of the things the League of Women Voters has been doing for years and years and years, and by the way, we're celebrating our 100th anniversary in just two years, um, is we analyze uh, the pros and the cons of each ballot measure in an unbiased way. And so we have uh, League members who are going to be presenting those. That's also going to be broadcast, so you would be able to watch that on YouTube or 
Um, I believe listened to it on KVMR as well. I don't know about KVMR that night. This week? Yeah. No. No. Okay. Um, but anyway, come and support the people who have done the research for you. Um, so, again, thank you so much. And I'm going to now turn it over to Mary Jane Hunergart, who is our moderator for tonight. Hi, this is going to be really interesting. <laughs> Um, well, have a seat. I'll actually be able nice. to grab one of these chairs. <laughs> okay, well, she's getting my seat. A good evening. I'd rather face everyone. I think this is okay. Okay, we stand at again, stand at I don't want to step on our toes. Anyway, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, good evening and welcome. Oh, th thank you so much, Bill. Okay, cool. That's great. There. Nice job. Good evening. <laughs> And welcome to the Candidates Forum for the Nevada County Sheriff, sponsored by the League of Women Voters of Western Nevada County. I'm Mary Jane Hunergart. I'm a member of the League, and I'm moderating tonight's program. I'd like to thank League members Doug Bianchi and Janice Bedane for organizing these forums. I'd also like to thank California YMCA Youth and Government's Gold Country Delegation for volunteering to help staff this event. To present this evening's ground rules and introductions, please welcome Forest Charter High School student and founding member of Youth and Government's Gold Country Delegation, Jihada Mohammed. Please remember to, that we maintain a neutral environment, meaning no, no, meaning nothing campaign related, whether presidential, issue related or local candidate related, may showing during, this, during the forum. The League of Women, oh, okay. the League of Women Voters is non-persistent organization. It does not, it doesn't support or oppose candidates. The League, uh, the League has two arms, issue advocacy and citizen education. Our forums are part of the education arm, and we and are provided to you, the voters as community as a community service. We please take a moment to turn off or silence your cell phone. We request that no videos are taken during the forum. NCTV is broadcasting live, and we. And we will have a video, full video available in the few in a few days. Okay. The stream is viewable on Comcast and Sudden Link, Channel 17, and NevadaCityTV.org. This evening, we are presenting the candidates paying <clears throat> for the office of Nevada County Sheriff. Currently held by Keith Royal, the mission of the Sheriff Office is to provide excellence in public service in partnership with our community. The Sheriff's roles actually encompasses Sheriff Connor, Sheriff's Corner, and <clears throat> public administrator. Administrator. Nevada County's current sheriff is Keith Royal. Details about the sheriff's office are available at mynevadacounty.com. There are two candidates currently in running Shannon Moon and Bill Simmers. Audience questions will be written or rather printed, if possible, on cards. We'll Will our cards runner please rise, raise their hands? These, 
These volunteers will station around the room throughout the forum, distributing and collecting question cards. Raise your hands when you like a card or when you're ready to submit a question. If you think you might like to ask a question, please get a card now if you don't already have one. Ask questions for candidates to answer and refrain from asking personal questions. Any follow-up questions you have must be asked on the cards. Questions will be screened or removed or consulted. Oh, screen two removed or duplicates. And to remove all personal questions. To help our screeners, please make questions brief and most importantly, legible. In addition to audience questions, we have a media, media panel who will pose verbal um, questions to the candidates. Our media, media panelists are from K and OC, okay, NCO, Chris Gilbert from KVMR, Paul Emery from the Union, Alan, Alan Rakelmi from Ubanet, Paso Falls Holder, <laughs> Voice Holder. <laughs> Candidates will have two minutes if he's from opening and closing statements and one and one and a half minutes a piece to answer questions. If a candidate would like to rebuild, like, like you rebuttal, they will raise their hands. And one, addition, one additional minute will be allowed to both candidates. Candidates will alternate in their order of questioning, I mean, answering questions. We flipped a coin a minute, a few minutes ago, to determine who will go first. First, Corsi is Corsi is paramount for a smooth event. I mean, running event. Candidates will not interrupt each other, and candidates will have the floor until their time is up. Our timer, our timer tonight is Steve Hill. He will ensure that candidates stick within the within the time the timer has cards he'll hold up the yellow cards indicates 30 seconds left to speak and the red cards means time's up if a candidate is speaking when the car red card is held up they may finish their sentence candidates will ask for no run ones or compound sentences at the red card please audience we ask that you hold your applause until the end of the forum to allow the candidates as much time as possible to express their views on issues, which is, I trust why you all, why we're all here. Please refrain from outbursts in other words. Please do not cheer, boo, hiss, stump, or any of the sort. We provide, we provide a non-participant setting for undecided voters to hear all positions. So any demonstrations of support or opposing opposition to the candidates or their position will be considered out of order. At the end of the evening, we will thank our candidates with our applause. We will adjourn at or before 8.30 p.m. Thank you for your attention and your readiness. To read and learn more, I mean, to listen and learn, I will turn the forum back over to our moderator, Mary Jane Carnegie. Thank you, Jihada. Now it's time to meet the candidates for sheriff. Based on our selection method, our first candidate to give opening statements will be Shannon Moon. Shannon, you have two minutes. Thank you. It's not so easy talking in front of the public, so I appreciate what you've just done. I am Shannon Moon. I'm a captain at the Nevada County Sheriff's Office, and I'm running to be your sheriff because I love Nevada County. My wife, Amy, who is also a respected law enforcement member 
and I have both dedicated our careers to providing public safety services to this wonderful town. We are raising our three daughters here, and just as you, we want our family to be safe. I will leverage my 28-year career at our sheriff's office, six of those years being at the highest level attainable captain, to ensuring that Nevada County is the safest place to live, work, and visit. The sheriff's office is part of this community's fabric. And in truly, to be truly effective, we must merit the support and trust from those that we serve. As your sheriff, I will set the highest levels of priorities on integrity, transparency, accountability, and assuring that we always look at the focus of reducing crime and the fear of crime in Nevada County. We are a $35 million business without a business plan. So from the get-go of my candidacy, I have talked about my strategic plan, a plan that focuses on, first and foremost, our wonderful personnel, our community engagement, our organizational programs, our facilities, and our technology at the Sheriff's Office. With this plan, we will have a one-way uh, uh, direction for all of our staff to ensure the highest levels of service to our community. Plus, it will allow you, the public, to see what our plan is to keep us accountable because, as we all know, actions speak louder than words. I am the most qualified candidate to lead this sheriff's office into the future, a future of partnerships and a future of transparency and a future of uh, moving forward. I ask for your vote in November and I'm honored to be here today. Thank you. Thank you, Shannon. Next, we will hear opening statements from Bill Smothers. Bill, you have two minutes. Thank you. First, I'd like to thank the Women uh, League of Voters for having us here tonight. My name is Bill Smithers and I'm running for Nevada County Sheriff because your safety is my highest priority. I was born and raised right here in Nevada County. My wife, Christina, and I have been married for 26 years, and we have raised three great children who all still live here in the community. I started my law enforcement career with the Nevada City Police Department, where I was able to gain the necessary knowledge and experience uh, to further my law enforcement career. I eventually accepted employment with the Nevada County Sheriff's Office, where I have since promoted up through the ranks to my position right now as executive lieutenant approximately six years ago. Since being with the Sheriff's Office, I have enjoyed my job every day. I have worked in and managed all of the major divisions within the Sheriff's Office from corrections, patrol, to special investigations. This has uh, been an honor protecting the and serving the community that I grew up in for the last 25 years, and I look forward to continuing that service as your next Sheriff in Nevada County. As sheriff, I want to bring my five-point plan to Nevada County, which includes safeguarding our families and our community, protecting our children and our schools, addressing the needs and concerns of the rural residents and neighborhoods, expanding technology to protect our public and our, our officers, all while maximizing our funding within the sheriff's office to put more deputies on the street. As your next sheriff, I will bring a proactive approach to dealing with the criminal element in Nevada County, not only to keep you safe, but to help reduce the recidivism that is so prevalent in our community. I will work diligently with the surrounding agencies to combine our, our forces and resources to um, make sure that we alleviate these issues that we're facing in Nevada County affecting our quality of life. Again, thank you very much for having me here tonight, and I appreciate all appreciate all of you for being here. So, Bill, we need to do a mic check. Is your mic on? It is on. Is it that is better? On. Better? Okay. Sorry about that. Okay. Thank you. To get us started on the questions portion of the forum, we will begin with an audience question. Um, candidates, you'll have a minute and a half piece to answer. So the first question. What are the top two objectives you are most passionate about accomplishing in your first year as sheriff? Bill, you'll go first on this one. So as I said, I have a five-point plan that I want to bring to Nevada County, but uh, utmost is um, serving our, our employees that, that serve you in, in Nevada County. We're currently short across the board from our dispatch corrections and our patrol division. I want to make sure that we have enough deputies on the street 
um, for officer safety reasons and to be able to provide the community the service that they deserve. Along with that, as I stated, I want to make sure that this, uh, this community is safe. Uh, Nevada County, the face of Nevada County has changed so much uh, in my lifetime being here. Uh, and just in the last five years, we've seen a lot of different issues that we're facing in the community that we need to address. Uh, the problematic homelessness that we see on a daily basis that are committing crimes, uh, and the recidivism that we keep seeing of people coming to jail and they're back out on the street committing more crimes. A lot of that has to do with um, the change in, in laws from felonies to misdemeanor. But as your sheriff, um, being part of the California State Sheriff's Association, you do have the, the voice to be able to go to um, Sacramento and, and make sure that we're heard what we need to do and what we need to focus on to make uh, California and Nevada County a safe place to live and work and thrive. Thank you. Thank you, Shannon. So top two priorities, uh, since the beginning of my campaign, I've talked about a strategic plan. And, and the strategies of that plan, again, are personnel, first and foremost. Uh, our personnel need to be supported. They need the highest levels of training. They need a path, a, a, a written codified path on their way for advancement. Uh, so it's not, it's not uh, cryptic or uh, part of the, the good old boy system. We need to look at uh, how we interact with our community, with our community engagement. We need to do more. We need to get out of our cars more. We need to look at the uh, organizational programs. And when I, when I talk about programs, uh, first and foremost are our jail programs for our incarcerated population. Uh, we need to do more in order to uh, get that transition from jail to community to allow people to, to truly succeed when they get out uh, of custody so that we don't have that revolving door. Uh, another one of the, the points in that organizational program is focusing more on our youth. Uh, we have uh, two resource officers for the entire county that are for enforcement. We need to get into uh, more of a, a communication and re relationships with our kids in our community. Uh, facilities, we have uh, facility issues that we need to look at and technology we need to use in order to make sure that, that we do provide the efficient services for, for this community. Our jobs are very complex. Uh, it takes a lot of hard work and a lot of great people to provide the services. And I look forward to, to pushing that strategic plan forward for you as your sheriff. Thank you. And just in case it wasn't clear, you do get a minute rebuttal if you'd like. Just go ahead and raise your hand and I'll call on you for that. So thank you. Our next question will come from the media and we will go from left to right, beginning with Pascal with you, Bennett. We also alternating too. Oh yes, you'll alternate, and so um, for the next one, Shannon will go first. Thank you, Mary. Thanks. Good evening, candidates. <clears throat> Your one of you will be sheriff, and you will be working very closely with other emergency services, namely firefighters. Um, <clears throat> the threat of wildfire is something that's of concern to anybody in Nevada County, at least anybody who pays attention, and. Can you talk a little bit about how you could have more or better communication with firefighters, with uh, emergency, especially as it relates to evacuations? And do you have any specific ideas or plans that you would like to put in place? Thank you for the question. Uh, I started uh, looking for a liaison within our agency that could work with the fire department, that could work with uh, and get trained in some of the uh, investigative uh, aspects of, of fire technology so that we do have a better, so that we can have a better communication line with our, with our firefighters. I think that's one of the biggest concerns that I, I know I have when I, and when I speak to the community about our homeless issues in Nevada County is that threat of that wildfire. Uh, and it, the, the only way in which we can work on those is, is to have relationships. So working, going to the chief's meetings uh, once a month, looking at what their issues are, uh, making sure that they understand that we are there for, for them as a, as a resource and going to calls with them. Uh, I think that's an important uh, you know, place in which we can improve a lot of that relationship. Uh, it, it, it's definitely uh, uh, when we get out there and the calls for service are pending and we are short and limited on staffing, we do need to work together more and have that partnership with our, with our fire agencies. I just recently uh, had some uh, very 
initial meetings with the fire department on looking at some uh, space rentals of the fire stations that they're not using for our staff. And again, which would help with that relationship and that communication level uh, so that when we do have those uh, evacuation notices, you know who that person is and you're, you're there standing with them at those command stations for this and, and working on the safety of Nevada County. Thank you, Bill. Thank you. So I, I do know how important that is. Uh, that was one thing that my father, uh, he uh, gave back to this community for 36 years as a battalion chief retired from CAL FIRE. So I know how important that relationship is between law enforcement and fire. He was also cross sworn as a law enforcement officer. I believe it's important to have that relationship. Uh, I have had a great working relationship with the fire agencies that we deal with, whether it's Consolidated Fire or the smaller agencies such as Penn Valley and Rough and Ready, uh, Town of Washington. Uh, I believe it's important that we have regional training with those firefighters. Uh, we do more with them and we get more out into the public together to make sure that we're working with homeowners associations to make sure that we have evacuation plans in place that we can work with them and they know what we're going to do and we know what they're gonna do in any given situation that we have to come across and deal with. So the relationship uh, with the fire agency is very, very strong uh, between the sheriff's office. Uh, we rely on them just as much as they, we re they rely on us. Uh, and as I said in my uh, uh, past, that I don't care what color uniform we're wearing, I wanna be able to be there for them and I want them to be there for us. So I wanna make sure that that relationship continues to grow and strengthens. Thank you. Thank you. Next question will come from our audience and Bill, you'll be answering it first. Okay. Since body cams will so soon be the new norm, will you pledge to release controversial film within 30 days, such as large cities do now? Yes, I believe that that's a huge part of transparency with the community that we serve. Uh, as long as there's no legalities about releasing that video, um, I will be more than happy to make sure that that is released to the public and to the media so they're aware of what um, has transpired in any given incident that we're involved in. Thank you, Shannon. Yeah, I think that that is the whole point of being transparent and having that relationship where the community trusts what we're doing. Uh, from the get-go, uh, before I announced my candidacy, I have been in favor of body-worn cameras. I believe that they create a different contact out in the field and it's safer for our staff and definitely safer for our community members. The 30 days, you know, it's, it's about the, the timing with short staffing on making sure that uh, it has been processed. We would definitely need to uh, be in touch with our district attorney on making sure we're not releasing things prior to a, a, a filing. Uh, but definitely, if, the, if there's an issue with any type of use of force that is on, uh, on video, we, we owe it to our community to, to release that. That's the whole reason why we have it. So yes. Thank you. Next question will come from our media, and Shannon, you'll be answering first. Um, let's have a question from the union, please. Hello. Hey, I'm Alan Raquelme with the union. Uh, I got a follow-up question about the body cameras. Um, what I'm interested in is how would you implement this program? And what I mean is what officers would wear the cameras? Is it only the ones that are in the patrol cars out in the community? Um, would, would people sign up for a camera when they, when they come onto duty, sign it out uh, when they leave? Would you, everybody have the same camera every day? Would jail staff also wear cameras? That's a good question. Thank you, Alan. Uh, implementation clearly takes uh, a lot of time and effort in making sure that we, we don't just put something out there without researching what other agencies have done. I've talked with several agencies that have them. Uh, I think it is important that it's uh, across the board on all staff that are having interactions with the public. Uh, the, the issue that I see with the jail is sometimes the jail staff are, are definitely doing uh, you know, searches and different things with, with the prisoners that would, you wouldn't want to record uh, on a camera. Uh, but looking at it as patrol staff, we are currently in the process and have our animal control officers with a, a pilot program right now wearing uh, the cameras. Uh, search warrants, uh, anytime our officers are on uh, SWAT missions and we're, we're in those incidences that have a, a high likelihood of a use of force incident, I think those need to be recorded, uh, again, for the, the safety of our officers and the safety uh, of our community. Thank you. 
And Bill. Thank you for the question. Um, so my plan is, um, that's one of the things that I want to make sure, and I know that we just got the grant, so that is exciting that we're able to, to move forward with uh, outfitting our officers. Uh, it's gonna depend on funding, obviously, and we have to come up and develop a policy regarding those. But what I would like to see is any officer that is in uniform will have one of those cameras on. Uh, that includes our correctional officers. Uh, just like our court, our um, uh, corrections uh, security with cameras in there, there's certain things that we can't record. Uh, but when it comes to a major incident with inside the facility, those can be activated when you're doing an, ext uh, an extraction from a cell or if there's a fight within the day room where the officer's gonna be, but they're, they do have their rights to, to privacy, so there's certain things that won't be recorded there. Um, but when it comes to our patrol deputies, uh, our narcotics division, our SED team that's out there serving search warrants, uh, anybody that has high uh, um, possibilities of any type of use of force and incident, uh, I'd also like to see our deputies that are in the courtroom, court security, also have those in there because the way society has changed now and the individuals that we're dealing now more and more that are coming to court, uh, are uh, volatile, so we want to make sure that we're protecting our officers and the public and making sure that we're being transparent transparent with the public, too. Thank you. And thank you. And Shannon, you requested a rebuttal? Yeah, j just real quick. We, we uh, installed cameras inside our correctional facilities several years ago. Uh, so there are cameras in all of the housing units, uh, booking areas, or sally port, uh, that we have used uh, numerous times to not only... Uh, settle complaints that were against officers that just didn't happen, but also able to, to really look at different use of forces and different things. So uh, you, cameras, body worn, definitely uh, would be a, a, another layer of that, but, but I do wanna make sure we all understand that we do have cameras inside of our facilities. And yes, go. Yes, just to rebut to that. Uh, so um, back in, I believe it was 2012 was when we did our security upgrade to the facility. We added additional cameras, so we're up to about uh, 132 security cameras within the facility. Uh, I'm in the process of going out for an RFP to write a new contract for a security upgrade uh, to add additional cameras within the facility. We've identified a lot of areas within the facility that there are blind spots, that incidents do happen, so I believe it's important that we also outfit our officers um, that they can protect themselves and protect those inmates that we're dealing with inside the facility. Thank you. Thank you. The next question will come from the audience, and Bill, you'll be answering it first. Beginning day one, you both have said you can start day one. You will need your team in place. Who have you selected as your undersheriff? So I made myself... Uh, everybody aware of this at the very beginning uh, when we had our first forum with the Deputy Sheriff's Association. I've announced uh, Captain Jeff Pettit will be my undersheriff, that's who I will name. Um, I've known Jeff for a long time, worked with him for you know, a little over 20 years. Um, Jeff believes in my vision for the Sheriff's Office. He's trusted and respected within the Sheriff's Office and he has the training and knowledge to step into that role as an undersheriff. Thank you, Shannon? Yeah, so I have not identified my undersheriff, and that has been uh, one of the you know the most uh, asked questions while I've been out on that campaign trail. Uh, what I've said and what I am true to is that it is a very important position within our, our organization. Uh, the three captains in our agency uh, report to that undersheriff, and plus our, our financial officer reports to that undersheriff. Uh, I have spoken with many people, uh, including several uh, very well respected and experienced uh, officers from outside our agency. And to honor their requests, I will not say their names because it will impact their current positions. Uh, and, I, and, and that is important to me. Uh, what I want the, the public to understand is there's only one name on that ballot. And that one person leads our organization. Uh, the idea of having a team definitely uh, it would be the number one uh, job once we get started on day one. Uh, and there are several people that I'm still looking at uh, moving forward for that for that position. Thank you. Uh, and Bill, would you like a rebuttal? I would just like to add to that. Um, 
that was my choice at the very beginning because I believe in transparency. Transparency to the employees that we serve and the community that we serve. I want people to know who is going to be second in charge. Uh, that undersheriff is in charge of the day-to-day -day operations and has a lot of responsibility. And I think it's important that the, the citizens that we serve and the men and women of the sheriff's office know um, because they want change and we're going to bring change from the top down. So that's what I wanted to make sure everybody's aware of up front. Thank you. Thank you. All right, the next question will come from our media and Shannon, you'll be answering this first. Uh, KNCO, would you ask a question, please? Yes, uh, there have been concerns expressed around the state regarding how law enforcement deals with people with mental health problems or issues. I was wondering, how do you view your department about this and do you feel current training is adequate? Yes, yeah, so I've spent most of my career on what we call our crisis negotiations team, uh, which is basically learning how to talk to people that are in crisis, to provide time and space for people to work through and give them options when they're in the middle of uh, uh, rapidly evolving and, and uh, sometimes dangerous situations. So the way in which we deal with and how we prepare our staff moving forward is through training. Uh, it is imperative that we look at how to de-escalate situations when we can. And I think we all have to recognize when we say de-escalation, the, the person still needs to, to be the one that de-escalates. So there are certain times where you are in a rapidly evolving situation where you have to make a split second decision. Uh, but having the ability to talk, having the ability to, to have that time and space, I think uh, all across uh, California, that has been a priority, and we need to look at that increased training. Again, we're at minimum uh, training levels uh, for that, for de-escalation and crisis uh, de-escalation training. We need to do more. We need to do more for our correctional staff. Uh, we need to do more for our patrol staff. Uh, we need to do more for our animal control staff that are out there uh, in the public working with and having a lot of contacts with folks that have mental health challenges. Uh, one of the biggest, uh, I think, state policy failures has been the, the closure of a lot of our state mental health facilities. So we're the ones doing the, uh, the work out in the communities. Thank you. Bill. So I, I believe that that's very important. Um, with the individuals that we're dealing with now, uh, the use of forces that we're seeing across the United States regarding um, the mental health issues. When I was patrol lieutenant, we made sure that we provided the crisis intervention training um, to all of our sworn personnel, at least from lieutenants down. Uh, we attended with all of the surrounding law enforcement agencies to make sure that our, uh, our personnel had that training to be able to de-escalate. I believe it's very important. Uh, I want to try to bring that same training to our correctional officers because our correctional officers are dealing with these individuals 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days out of the year, more so than what our uniform officers on patrol are dealing with them. So I believe it's important that we can de-escalate those, those situations uh, along with the body cameras to be able to record the, the interactions with that to help further that, that training that we can do. But I believe that we should be training yearly on that type of uh, situation in our community because it's constantly changing. And, and with inside the jail too is looking at different uh, evidence-based programs to try, try to help bring and reduce those, those issues. Um, there's currently right now, um, we're looking at the medication aided treatment, uh, individuals that are coming in, uh, under the influence of heroin, uh, and, and putting them on and using something such as Suboxone or Methadone has shown a decrease in the California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation that it, it has lowered the, um, issues of people committing some type of viola uh, violations by 58% with inside the prison. So I think it's important that we bring that to the correctional facility. And Shannon, I see your request for rebuttal. Yeah, just real quick. We, we also have, uh, I've worked with uh, the city of Grass Valley, Chief Alex Galmagard uh, and the Dignity Health for a grant. And Grass Valley was uh, the forefront, the police department was the forefront in getting what we call angel beds. So out in the community, people, instead of going to jail, uh, being able to say, I need help, and going straight into treatment. Uh, we, they partnered with CORE. I've been talking with uh, Chief Gamelgard. Uh, the Sheriff's Office uh, in the future will be absolutely uh, in that same arena in trying to get people help 
uh, that, that have those issues. Thank you. And that actually segues nicely into our next question, which will be from the audience. And Bill, you'll be answering first. What are your plans to rehabilitate prisoners and reintegrate them into society? So that's one of the, uh, currently one of my assignments as the executive lieutenant within the jail. Uh, so it's providing services, making sure that we have those individual, uh, individual services that we can provide to them, whether it's religious based, uh, to veteran services, to mental health services, uh, making sure that our inmates um, receive those type of things through social services so when they are released, uh, they are hopefully um, um, not going back out into the uh, back out into the community and, uh, and reoffending. So we want to make sure um, three weeks ago we had an individual that was in custody and he kept on getting arrested for uh, trespassing and he was trespassing at a location that was a business in Grass Valley. He truly believed that uh, that was his home. Uh, I went up and I spoke with him. We made sure that we got social services involved with him and came over and they took him. They provided some services to him that he needed and that individual has not returned back to custody. So I think it's important that we provide every uh, opportunity that we can to these individuals that aren't trying to commit a crime, but they just don't have the mental capacity to uh, know the difference between wrong and right. Thank you. And Shannon? I started in corrections, uh, 1990, and to see uh, the impact of incarceration on a community uh, and talking with a lot of the incarcerated population. Uh, for most of the, the prisoners that we have, it's not a matter of if, but when they get released to our community and we owe it as the sheriff's office and having them in our custody and control to assure that they are uh, released with the most uh, equipment, most uh, ability, sorry, to uh, really be successful in the community. Uh, as your jail commander, I changed the release times from 4 a.m. to 8 a.m. to assure when folks got out, they were uh, able to get services. I opened the ability for uh, behavioral health staff, eligibility staff from social services to come over one-on-one, -on -one, sit down with inmates, and have a release plan. So when they got out of custody, it wasn't that they were walking around Nevada City and following back into the, the same steps that they had been in. Uh, increasing our mental health treatment, our substance abuse treatment, all of those things are extremely important as part of that strategic plan for organizational programs. <clears throat> And, and most importantly, working on a transition from jail to community reentry program for Nevada County. As your sheriff, those are definitely the priorities that I will bring forward for our community. Thank you. And uh, Bill, I received word from NTTV. They're having trouble hearing you. So please, uh, they request you speak loudly, maybe more I just slowly. moved it closer to me too, so. Cool, okay, thanks. The next question will come from the media. Um, Paul from KVMR. Um, there have been some problems in the last few years with evidence gathering from the uh, from the sheriff's department. It's affected the outcomes of some trials and created some confusion. I don't want to get into the specific names of the individuals involved. <clears throat> uh, from your viewpoint, was that the result of a lack of training or a lack of discipline? Um, and what would you do to prevent those kinds of things from happening in the future? Shannon, you'll be taking this one first. I, th I think you have to look at it as a combination. It's a complex issue. Uh, we have to strive for making sure that the, the officers that we select for employment are the best that we can have. We have to assure that the people that we promote into supervisory and management and commander positions truly understand their role within our organization of accountability. When an officer on the stand says that they didn't feel like they had enough training to do the job that they were doing, I take that as a department failure. I take that as we need to do better for our staff. We need to look at the selection process for some of those uh, uh, special assignments, uh, not only for the detectives, but for the detective sergeants and the detective uh, managers of those positions and truly uh, mentor them and not just tell them uh, just because you're a really good cop doesn't make you a really good detective. You have to have mentoring. You have to have people around you that want to see you succeed. Uh, one of the things as, as I was growing up within this organization was the, the supervisors that I had that said, your reputation is all you have. 
make sure when you go to court, the court truly does see your integrity, not only the district attorney, but our public defenders and our, our defense attorneys, uh, because that is probably, uh, as, as a detective, you're, you're pr putting up the evidence on someone's very important case for a conviction. Uh, so training, uh, appointment, and selection, I think, are, are priorities that we need to make sure that we do our best for Nevada County. Thank you. Bill. I agree. Uh, one of the big things is making sure that we're hiring the right people and making sure that they're receiving the training that they deserve. I was the investigations lieutenant when that uh, transpired, and when it was brought to my attention, we addressed it immediately. We have changed our protocols and our policies regarding the way we deal with uh, investigations. But just uh, like anything else, if it's a brand new deputy coming to patrol, we want to make sure that we have the best training officers that we can to provide um, the service to the community. And when you step into a, a detective position, uh, a, the senior detectives and the, the sergeant in charge of those units are the ones that are uh, responsible for making sure that we train those individuals. Uh, and so it's definitely important that we make sure uh, because it was identified as a training issue. And once we got somebody in there that was willing to work with the detective, uh, we started seeing improvement with that situation. And, and uh, as I said, um, just having the right people in there to make the uh, right decisions and the right training uh, that they need. Thank you. The next question comes from our audience. And Bill, you'll be answering it first. What are your personal views of the gun violence restraining order legislation? How would you ensure the sheriff's office is maximizing the potential of this legislation? Well, I think it's very important. Uh, like I say, uh, we're dealing now completely um, with a different society that we, we dealt with when I started in law enforcement 25 years ago. And I think it's very important that we protect the uh, victims of domestic violence and that we make sure that we do everything in our power to ensure their safety. Um, when we have something that we need to address, we will address it immediately and make sure that we get those weapons out of the hands of the people that do not deserve to have them um, or could be a threat to the public or to the, the victims. So we definitely will address those immediately. Thank you. Shannon. So gun violence restraining order. I've, I've had several conversations uh, in the community uh, with Amanda Wilcox. She's been the one that has been uh, truly at legislature pushing as much gun safety uh, as she can based off of clearly her, her very tragic situation. I was the case agent on the case that happened in 2001 at the HEW building where we, we, we lost a lot of uh, community members. Uh, and when we look at gun violence restraining order, it has a nice balance between people's right to carry, right to, to bear arms, but also having a due process, court process with someone that's in crisis. And it's not just about crimes. I think the most important thing to look at is the safety of our family when people are in depression and mental health issues and they're thinking about suicide. We have one of the highest levels of, of firearm suicide uh, in the nation. And when we have an ability, if someone's in crisis, where we can take a, a weapon until someone gets through that crisis through due process from a judge, uh, that is, I think, the, the best balance. We have to train our staff to make sure that they understand that the gun violence restraining order is out there and it is a, a tool that they can use and we need to prioritize that so that they understand that that is truly what we are there for for safety in this community. Thank you. The next question will be from our media and Shannon, you'll take it first. We're back to you, Bennett. Uh, both of you talk a lot about training and training uh, patrol, training deputies. Do you feel that uh, at this point uh, training is adequate for the, the current force? And is there actually, do, do you have the budgetary means to uh, do more training, better training, or is it just a, um, or is it just a talking point? <laughs> We train at levels of minimum standard for state of California. We need to increase our training. And, and we do that a couple of different ways. Uh, we reallocate some of our training money. Uh, currently, if one or two people want to go out of the area, it costs a lot of money for travel, hotels, their training. 
if we could provide some of that regional training concept within our community, with our partners, with our other law enforcement agencies, Grass Valley, Nevada City, California Highway Patrol, state parks, our fire agencies that are our sworn officers, where we would be able to use that training more efficiently, or the funding for that training more efficiently. We would train together. We would have the same concepts when we're in different issues and different uh, the reasons for our training. I think that's the, the one thing that uh, doesn't make you the most popular person in the world when you say two people can't go down to San Diego uh, for their one training class. But if you provide that efficiency for the, the funding that you would do that for the entire agency, I think that is uh, clearly more important. And we need to uh, look at that regionalization and working together and being more effective with the, the very limited resources we all have in Nevada County. Thank you. Bill. From the beginning, that's what I said. I want to make sure uh, we've done things such as our regional dispatch center and we work together with the other agencies. So uh, all of our budgets uh, uh, have not really increased a whole lot over the last couple of years. You know, we, we currently uh, fall into the PERS retirement, so we've taken a hit with our salaries and our benefit packages that we're trying to make up. So when it comes to our training, I think our training is uh, very important that we, we provide even more so. That we need to look at uh, areas in our budget that we can cut things that we don't really need uh, to provide that training um, so those officers can pro provide a better service in the community. Uh, when I first came to the sheriff's office, we had a lot of in-house uh, post-certified trainers that we were able to conduct a lot, uh, a lot of the training in-house. Uh, and I would like to work with Grass Valley Nevada City, the fire department, because they have law enforcement personnel too that are post-certified along with California Highway Patrol to make sure that we're training one another, working together, uh, and and, and look at our budget to make sure that we are adequately training our officers. I don't believe that we spend enough time at the range. Uh, you know, we should be doing it. We meet the bare minimum, uh, but that's one of the uh, most lethal weapons that we uh, carry in our tool bag, and that's something that we need to do more training with. So that's one thing that I will focus on is the training. So when a class is only offered in San Diego to make sure that we have detectives or deputies that are are receiving that training uh, in a timely manner. Thank you. Thank you. The next question will come from our audience, and Bill, you'll answer it first. What is your opinion on illegal immigration in Nevada County? What role should ICE play? ICE or Nevada County Sheriff's Office to to play in that. Nevada County Sheriff's Office should not be in the uh, the uh, immigration sweep uh, process in, in Nevada County. Um, the laws in the state of California with SB 54 have changed um, to allow or uh, that has basically pitted uh, local and state law enforcement against federal law enforcement. Um, I don't really like that. We should be able to help one another. If somebody is here illegally in our country that's uh, here committing crimes, we should be able to take action and notify those individuals to make sure that they're uh, not in our communities and not in our country. Um, if, if ICE does come in to the, um, to the area, um, if they're not infringing on anybody's constitutional rights, um, they're going to be allowed to do their job. Yeah, I think if they're coming in here looking for somebody that's illegally uh, in our country committing a crime just like the rest of us when we're out looking for people committing crimes, um, they need to be held accountable. Thank you. Shannon. Yeah, the, the, the thing to remember is that as law enforcement officers, we enforce the law. We don't create the law. Our legislators do that. So we have to make sure uh, that we are familiar and are experts in what that law says and the way in which... Uh, we provide law enforcement services. People that are here, that are in this community, that aren't here legally, uh, should have the ability to come report crimes just as if someone was uh, a, a citizen of the United States or a, or a local uh, of Nevada County. We have to assure that so that we have the safety aspect of this community. That's our role in this community. We are not enforcement enforcers of, of immigration law. Uh, so making sure that we continue to have the trust and support from everyone in this community, I think is imperative. I think we need to look at, uh, you know, when we, when we, the SB 54 laws came out, uh, there were some laws that were on there or some charges that were on there that, that I didn't, I thought there were some more that were violent crimes that maybe should have been added to that 
to that list for, for the safety of this community. Uh, but that's what gets settled out in the legislature. Uh, the one thing that, that we need to make sure is, is we don't politicize law enforcement in Nevada County. Uh, this is a wonderful community, very diverse, and everyone uh, deserves to, to feel safe in this community. Thank you. Next question will come from our media. And uh, the union, you're up. I wanted to go back to uh, the issue of funding. And what I'd like to ask is, when you're before the Board of Supervisors and you're trying to convince the board that you need more money for your budget, what do you say to them to convince them to get that? And also, regardless of that, I, I'm also curious about talking about cutting existing programs to have more training. What would you cut? I think the, the recognizing the Board of Supervisors controls our general fund money. Uh, so when you ask for more money, you, you better be able to be transparent with them on what you do have and, and what, uh, what resources you do allocate for which uh, different programs within our, our budget. Uh, I've always had a, a really great relationship with anyone that has sat on our Board of Supervisors uh, to make sure that uh, we do have those good relationships. Uh, transparency in the budget is just as important as the, the very important sheriff's work that we do in law enforcement. And when you ask for more, you have to be able to show what you've done and where your needs are on those priorities. Uh, I've gone to several department head meetings and we look at the Board of Supervisors uh, uh, priorities, priority A's for the entire board. So you would want to uh, present whatever resources that you wanted or, or, or more budget you would want to make sure that it was aligned with those priority A's for our Board of Supervisors. As far as cutting other programs for training, uh, the, the idea isn't necessarily a, a cut. It's about assuring that you set a priority based off of a strategic plan on what you want to do and you're not being reactive for things that are just happening. And someone comes up and says, what a great idea for this training class. But if you have a strategic plan on what you want your officers trained in, set that priority, set that training up so that you're not looking at, at uh, different cuts in other, other areas. Thank you. Bill? So currently the Sheriff's Office does have a strategic, strategic plan. Uh, we work on it every year, the lieutenants, captains, under sheriff, the sheriff, um, to what we budget. Uh, that's what our strategic plan is based off of. Uh, goals, objectives, um, our outcomes, and major accomplishments that we, we work on throughout the year. Um, and we look back to what we were able to accomplish the year before and what we want to accomplish the upcoming year. So it's sitting down and looking at it, and if, if somebody says, well, I think we ought to replace all the desks in, in a, the major crimes unit, and if they really don't need desks, it's cutting things like that to, be make, to make sure that we provide the additional uh, training to our officers. One of the things that I want to do that we've never had is we've never had a true grant writer for our department because there's a lot of untapped funding out there regarding grants for law enforcement to provide equipment, training, uh, different things like that that I would like to bring to the sheriff's office because uh, the budget is tight in the county and you know nobody wants to be in the red they want to stay in the black uh, and unless you raise taxes in the community and most people don't like to see that uh, which I don't want to have to do that but when the Board of Supervisors and they enact ordinances um, from the Land Use Act regarding marijuana to the no burn uh, campfire uh, ordinance in um, in the, the Yuba River Canyon and they ask us to do it. When I came here in 1998, it was a sergeant and four deputies. So that's what our patrol staff is running right now on a daily basis in 2018. So I think it's important that we put more deputies on the street and have highly qualified deputies too. So if we need to cut something, we will find something to cut to make sure they have that training. Shannon, I see you want a rebuttal? Yeah, I would respectfully disagree. We don't have a strategic plan. The, the goals, objectives, and uh, accomplishments are uh, from the CEO's office, and they request those to be done uh, yearly. Uh, we could ask half of our department on where they are even uh, stored, and I bet they wouldn't be able to tell you where they are because we don't involve our entire office. We ask uh, certain people to, to submit those. I've worked in, and as we 
see uh, in our department, we rotate quite a bit. So I've rotated in different divisions. I'll go into a new division. The lieutenants and the, and the supervisors in that division have no idea what the goals and objectives that the former captain uh, placed for them for that fiscal year. A strategic plan involves the entire department. It involves the community. It sets a, divi it sets a direction for everyone and it allows our community to also keep us accountable. To rebut that, <clears throat> um, so I've been a lieutenant for six years. Uh, once I was promoted to the level of lieutenant, I knew exactly where our budget books were, where our goals and objectives are, what we need to accomplish to be able to provide services to the community, and what we need to provide to the, uh, the department itself. Uh, so when, as a lieutenant, and I, I think that it is your commander that's above you that does not bring that knowledge to you, because I sat down with my captain at the time when I first got promoted to lieutenant to find out and research all of this, uh, to make sure that I was aware of it, and I sit down with my, my sergeants and my deputies in those different divisions and talk to them about those goals and object, objectives. What would they like to see? What we need to fix? What needs to be um, the outcome for next year and what happened last year that we weren't able to accomplish those. I think it's important that we communicate with one another and if it's not happening in another division, um, I, I think that comes from somebody above them that we need to make sure that we lead by example and make sure that everybody is well informed of where uh, things like that are in our system. Thank you. Next question comes from our audience. Bill, you'll be answering this one first. A common phrase in Eastern County is, what about Truckee? What will you do as sheriff to ensure adequate law enforcement coverage in the unincorporated area of Eastern County and other rural communities like the town of Washington? So that is part of my uh, five point plan. Uh, one of the things that I would like to do is have a problem oriented policing team and that's reallocating some of the positions within the department. Um, but that's also gonna require um, putting more deputies on the street too. But with a problem-oriented policing team that's addressing those major issues that are affecting our community, uh, whether it's drug activity, problematic homeless, homelessness, uh, a rash of burgs, uh, burglaries in a certain area of the community, that team will be focusing on those major issues that a normal patrol deputy on patrol cannot get to during his, his uh, daily shift. Hoping to uh, free up our patrol deputies to be more active, more proactive in the neighborhoods, in the outlying areas, and increase our, our response times to areas such as town of Washington. Uh, making sure that we have those grants that we can put more deputies on the street, whether it's uh, a U.S. Forest Service grant that we work under right now for our high country deputy. But with Truckee, we currently have a sergeant and two deputies up there. Uh, I would like to staff that with 24 hour, hour coverage. Um, because they get off at midnight right now, so I think the, the community up there deserves that. But with that, um, town of Truckee uh, is 33 square miles, and we cover the unincorporated area, along with our, our facility up there and, and court security for the, the courts up there. Um, we need to be more involved and more active in the, the eastern side of this, uh, this county uh, that we haven't been in several years since we lost our substation up there. So one of my goals is to get more deputies up the hill. Uh, we have a great working relationship with Truckee CHP and Truckee PD. So more deputies up the hill. Thank you. Shannon. When we, we talk about uh, more deputies, then we're talking about uh, our limited resources and there's just not enough to go around for everything. So uh, looking at reallocation, of some of the programs that we have, uh, staffing uh, a community or a problem-oriented policing team makes perfect sense for uh, close areas like Washington and North San Juan. Uh, the the Truckee area is unique. Uh, in 2007, 2008, I was fortunate enough to be assigned in our Truckee area as a sergeant. Uh, worked on some great relationships up there. Uh, part of that is also the education piece of knowing uh, what the in unincorporated area and the town area and the, those calls for service. And looking at data, looking at when those calls come in, we're looking at what types of calls for service they are and restructuring some of our, our staffing levels uh, based off of our current staffing levels on uh, where we can most effectively re have a response to crime. Our response times for some of those outlaying areas are pretty, uh, pretty high. And that doesn't make for a, a safe feeling when you're living out in those areas. I've talked with a lot of community in North San Juan, uh, the town of Washington and in Truckee. And uh, how we do that is reallocation of some of our services, 
Uh, grant funding is great, but there, it, it, we're unable to sustain positions. So we wanna look at using our current uh, grants, our Forest Service, our OHV grant, and just really using them uh, more appropriately and, and, and more efficiently. Thank you. The next question will come, come from the media, and Shannon, you'll be answering it first. Uh, KNCO, you're up. Uh, you feel legalizing marijuana will make the sheriff's department job easier or more difficult as the years progress? Legalizing as in nationwide? No, or? the state law legalizing medical and or recreational marijuana. Yeah, so a lot of what Prop 64 did for us is it, it did change some of the, uh, the environment that we have here in Nevada County. Uh, cannabis is not new to Nevada County. I've lived here for 50 years. Uh, the, our response to cannabis has to be aligned with what the state laws are. So when I say we don't in, uh, create the laws, we enforce the law. So looking uh, forward and looking into the future of what that means is assuring that we are safe and we look at what is clearly illegal and we focus our priorities to, to that clearly illegal cannabis because it is unsafe. We've seen our violent crimes. We've seen uh, the amount of money associated that are in homes uh, that people will either protect or steal with with their lives. Uh, we need to make sure that that black market, wild, wild west that's out there is uh, a priority for our services. Looking at uh, the what's regulated and going through and making sure that our code enforcement has more involvement uh, because when you see a deputy sheriff uh, show up to something that is not a crime, uh, it changes that contact for someone. There are several growers in our community that want to be regulated. I speak with them all the time. They need the education. They want the assistance. They want to be able to, to grow based off of what the legislature has provided for them. Uh, and we need to align our resources uh, and our priorities in Nevada County with that. Thank you. Bill. Same thing. Over the last several months, I've sat down with a lot of individuals in the cannabis industry in Nevada County um, and, and heard their side of the story. Uh, and as I explained to them, uh, all of my training came from law enforcement. Uh, so my experience is dealing with marijuana, um, and it was usually the wild, wild west. It was the shootouts. It was the home invasions. Uh, it was people that were growing 1,500 plants when they should have only been growing 15 plants. So those are the type of people that are, I, I was dealing with as a narcotics detective and a sergeant in this, in this community. I think it's important now that uh, it has legalized medicinally and recreationally. I think it's still kind of early with the recreational to see how that's going to pan out. But interesting talking to the individuals that are in business that want to make a profession of it, and they are very professional, uh, to hopefully try to get them out of the black market. And if we can eliminate that in our community, that's what we need to do. What I want to do, though, is I want to focus on those individuals that are coming to our community, that are committing the crimes, that are doing the home invasions, that are, that are um, tainting the water, that are doing damage to our, our, our forests. Those are the ones that we got to go after. Those are the ones that we need to protect everybody from, the, the growers that want to do it legitimately and the people that, that don't grow. Uh, so I think it's, it's uh, very important with the legal, legalization of marijuana that, um, you know, we focus on those individuals, uh, as Shannon mentioned. As sheriff, we don't make the laws, we enforce the laws, and that's what I'm going to do. Thank you. That's another great segue to our next question, which will be from in the audience. And Bill, you'll take first. And uh, recognizing that you don't make the laws, you just enforce them. Um, let's have your opinion. Uh, since the DEA no longer lists cannabis as a gateway drug, do you believe cannabis should remain classified as a Schedule One drug? So, as I said, I've set, I have sat down with a lot of the cannabis growers, uh, the uh, business owners now in our community, and spoke to them regarding that. Uh, as I explained to them, I'm, I'm not a chemist, I'm not a doctor, I'm not a, a scientist to determine um, if it's if it's you know providing the the health care that they need with that that it's not the sheriff's position to determine if it's a scheduled one or not um, that is up to the federal government uh, at the local level in the state of California as sheriff as I said um, it's it, it's legally medicinally and recreationally and as sheriff we don't make the laws we enforce the laws. Thank you, Shannon. Yeah, my opinion is it needs to be scheduled as a Schedule II uh, because 
you, you cannot do any of the uh, testing, you can't do any of the research uh, on a Schedule I uh, drug in the, the DEA scheduling in order to get uh, the testing done so that we can determine what needs to be set at different levels and different uh, uh, strains and different potency, uh, we have to be able to research uh, that item. And there is some movement in the FDA on approving some of the, the medicinal uses of, of cannabis. Uh, this is, again, this is not a, a new thing for Nevada County. People have been using cannabis in this community uh, medicinally and recreationally for years. Uh, we have to, uh, when, we, when the laws say that we decriminalize it, uh, we have to continue to move forward for that research uh, so that we can uh, provide people with the safety of what they're using. Uh, we see it out uh, in the community all the time with kids using uh, cannabis, with people using cannabis that they don't know where it was grown. Uh, so the regulation of potency, the regulation of assuring that the uh, pesticides have been uh, taken out of that, that's going to be a safety, a public safety issue for our community. Thank you. The next question will come from the media, and Shannon, you'll be answering first. Um, KVMR, you're up. Yes, uh, a conversation I had with a, with a law enforcement officer from Placer County um, uh, recently uh, when I suggested to him perhaps he might like to work for Nevada County uh, as an officer. And he said, oh, no, I couldn't do that. They don't pay well enough. Um, I like to, with the scope of that uh, apparent um, fact, uh, what uh, level of staffing of, do we have currently, and how big of a problem is is it that we don't seem to pay as well for our police uh, officers as Placer County and other neighboring counties? You know, Placer County is unique. They, we share a border with Placer County. They are three times our size with three times their budget because of a lot of the economic development uh, that they have in, in Placer County. So it's very difficult for us to, to compare with Placer. Our officers do it uh, all the time, and unfortunately, since they are so close, uh, we do see some of our staff uh, moving to Placer. But other agencies, you know, we are uh, in the middle of, of the, we see Grass Valley, the town of Truckee, they are in negotiations for their contracts. Uh, we have a higher pays than the municipality uh, police forces in our community. Uh, we need to stay uh, in line with that and making sure that we do attract uh, uh, staff and we retain the staff that we have. It takes a lot of training to get someone out on the street. A lot of costs go into hiring and training and getting them ready. The last thing you want is for them to, to leave to Placer County uh, or, or any other county. So when you look at uh, that personnel, uh, strategic planning of personnel, assuring that we treat our people respectfully so that they want to stay, assuring that we support them and train them to those highest levels of excellence. I think all of that combined creates an environment where people will want to stay and people will, will come to Nevada County to work in this extremely amazing community. Uh, uh, I, I, I wouldn't work in this field in anybody else's community. I was born here. Uh, this is my home, and uh, we need to uh, attract folks that are from this community just as much uh, as the ones that are, are moving around uh, that, that come into this field. Thank you. And Bill, it looks like you sat down uh, in front of an, a very non-sensitive mic, so please move it closer to your mouth. I'm in CTV. Okay. Um, yeah, you're up. Thanks. So that's one thing that we have lost. We have lost several good employees to Placer County. Um, as it was said, that Placer County is a more wealthy community than we are. They have the, the Bass Pro Shops, the Costco's, the strip malls. Uh, one of the things that we don't have is that tax base that they have, so they're able to uh, provide higher funding for their, their law enforcement agency uh, and a lot of their different um, uh, agencies within the county. Over the years, we have got close to them, and then they pull away again. One of the big things that really kills us with, with competing with Placer County is their incentive package. Their incentive package for what they're paid for um, it just pulls away from Nevada County deputies, and so it attracts people to go down there uh, to work. Uh, but when I first came to Nevada County Sheriff's Office, I was making $10.50 an hour um, supporting my wife and, and my children. Uh, it was a department that I truly loved working for. It was a community that I grew up in and I wanted to serve. Uh, so it didn't matter how much I was making. I wanted to be here. 
so that's changing that environment within our sheriff's office is hiring the right people, the people that are vested in our community, the people that want to be here, and the way you treat those individuals. Um, as I was brought up, do you treat people the way you want to be treated in any given situation? And I think if we do that with our employees, they're going to be willing to stay here because I want to attract people. And that's working with the Board of Supervisors to help with the funding and everything and, and, and go, to, go to bat for the, the different associations during their negotiations. Thank you. Uh, the next question will be from our audience, and Bill, you'll be answering first. What steps would you take to decrease the potential of gun violence in Nevada County? So um, gun violence in Nevada County. I mean, we uh, fortunately have not been touched with that um, like a lot of the major cities have throughout the United States. Uh, but one of the big things um, with that is helping educate the community. Uh, there are a lot of people that live in this community that are um, well armed, um, that they have those weapons uh, uh, legally. Uh, when I was in narcotics, um, that was one of the, the things that we were very proud of, that when we were working narcotics, that we were taking more, uh, more drugs off the street, more weapons off the street of people that don't need to have them, that shouldn't have them that are out there committing crimes. Uh, when we have uh, homes that are broke into and 13 to 15 guns are stolen, we need to do everything in our power to make sure that we try to recover those weapons as fast as possible so we can stop the violence. Uh, but it, it's just educating and training people and working with the community to make sure that the community is safe, that they're trained um, in case of there's a major incident, whether it's at the school or any of the businesses within the community. Thank you. Shannon. Yeah, I think, I think all safety starts with uh, the prevention through relationships. Uh, when we look at uh, our schools, assuring that our children have uh, good relationships with adults uh, outside of their family. I think looking back at, at my career, before I started in law enforcement uh, growing up in our school systems here in Nevada County, Seven Hills, Nevada Union, I always had uh, wonderful people around me that I felt included. I didn't feel different. Uh, when we look at uh, this community and its diversity, it is uh, also extremely welcoming uh, with different uh, ideas, different people, uh, different viewpoints. And when we can get out and have conversations, have those relationships, it will prevent crime, in my opinion. Gun violence, uh, we are very fortunate our crime levels in Nevada County are low. I think that's part of the, the choices that we make on where we live. Uh, it's not just necessarily uh, that you were born and raised here, but you come here for a reason. And the steps we need to take are continuing with our great relationships, uh, reaching out with our youth, reaching out with uh, our, our community, uh, looking at the, the folks that do uh, possess firearms that we educate on safe storage, I think is, is uh, highly important and we need to do a better job at education uh, with that aspect with whether it's social media, whether it's uh, us as a group with, with other agencies coming forward. Uh, but it all end, starts and ends with relationships. Thank you very much. So we have time for one last question uh, from our media. And Shannon, you'll be answering it first. Uh, Pascal from Ubinet, would you like to do the honors? So <clears throat> Governor Jerry Brown just signed um, AB 2103, which makes California the 26th state in the nation to require live fire training for people uh, that apply for concealed carry permits. Um, as of today, there is no requirement for anybody with a concealed carry permit to have ever fired a gun. Uh, can you tell us how you will implement the new requirement and or is there already a requirement in Nevada County because several jurisdictions already required that. So what is the state in Nevada County? Yes, yeah, so currently uh, our CCW holders, part of the requirement to get a CCW is you have to have a training certificate from a approved vendor that our sheriff's office approves. And we go over their outlines. We go over uh, assuring that they are training folks on uh, the importance of the liability of using force in a community. Uh, and it also has the requirement of familiarity in shooting of a firearm. 
and it's very specific. So weapons permits are associated with firearms by their serial number, their caliber. Uh, I think it's important that we continue assuring that folks are familiar with live firing their firearms uh, when they get their permits. Uh, we're in rural North State California, so it, it, we have several folks that uh, come in that request CCWs. I do the, the interviews. There's a nice balance between that background, that training certificate, uh, people going through the, the legal process to get the, the permits. Uh, so I, I don't see that as affecting us uh, here in Nevada County because uh, we have been fortunate that we have uh, a lot of that, that foundation of that uh, very uh, important piece in that legislature already in place in Nevada County. Thank you, Bill. So without going over what our policy is, <laughs> which Shannon just explained, one of the things that we do require though, um, so you are required an eight hour course uh, to first get your CCW. So it is very valuable because um, I've sat in on with the uh, interviews for concealed weapons permits and when somebody comes in and, and you know they're 50, 60, 70 years old and they want a weapon uh, as a concealed weapon uh, and they've never fired a weapon before um, until they went to the eight hour course. It's very important that they have that training because a lot of us grew up uh, firing weapons and having the gun safety taught to us. So it's very important. And after two years, they're required to go back and do a four hour recertification course too. So um, it really won't affect how Nevada County Sheriff's Office um, issues our CCWs because uh, as sheriff I will conti continue doing that but we want to make sure that we're keeping those weapons into the hands of the people that deserve them. The ones that don't, don't pass their criminal background checks or can not complete one of the uh, training uh, courses um, will not be issued a CCW. Thank you. Now it's time for closing statements. You'll have two minutes apiece done in reverse order from opening statements. To begin, we'll hear closing statements from Sheriff Candidate Bill Smethers. So again, I would like to thank everyone for coming out tonight because it is very important. November 6th is coming up real quick on us. Also like to thank the League of Women Voters for hosting this event tonight. As your sheriff, you have my promise that I'm gonna um, lead this office forward and into the future with my training and experience. I will lead by example as I have done my entire career. <clears throat> Sorry. Uh, I will stand with the men and women of this department shoulder to shoulder with honesty, integrity, and dedication to each and every one of you. Because of that, I have earned the endorsements of the Nevada County Deputy Sheriff's Association, Nevada County Correctional Officers Association, the Nevada County Professional Firefighters Association, Grass Valley Police Officers Association, Nevada City Police Officers Association, and 10 current Northern California Sheriffs. In closing, I will be tough on crime in Nevada County. I will make sure that you are safe and I will do everything in my power to reduce the recidivism that we see that is so prevalent. I will continue strengthening our relationships with all of the surrounding allied agencies and every citizen in this community to make sure that your voice is heard and we can do everything that we can for you to provide the services that you deserve. I look forward to serving you as your next sheriff and I again thank you very much for uh, allowing me to be here tonight and speak with you and I ask you to please visit my webpage at smithersforsheriff.com or my uh, Facebook page. Uh, my five point plan goes more into depth and you can, ex you can see what I would like to do within this community and my views on those issues. Thank you. Thank you. Now we'll hear closing statements from Sheriff Candidate Shannon Moon. Thank you all for being here and being engaged in the future, future of this amazing county. I grew up, uh, spent my entire life in this community. Uh, growing up, I watched with pride. Uh, my dad provide law enforcement services to this community, and it focused my own career in wanting to be a law enforcement officer uh, for my hometown. For the last three decades, while working for four different sheriffs, I have seen what has worked and what has not worked in Nevada County. On day one, I can and am ready to lead this amazing agency into the future. A future of partnerships, a future of transparency, and a future where your sheriff's office puts our community first. I am honored to have the endorsement of many elected officials in this community, elected by you. 
Board of Supervisors, mayors, council members, our retired CEO, uh, Rick Haffey, recently endorsed, a retired CEO from our courts, Sean Matroka, and a retired superintendent of the Nevada Joint Union High School, Dr. Louise Johnson. All very important people in this community that understand how important it is to be elected and have the confidence in not only my abilities, but my vision for what we need in Nevada County. I am honored to have won the primary election in June of this year, and I respectfully uh, ask for your vote in November. It would be an honor and an opportunity of a lifetime. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks to the candidates for participating in this evening's forum. You may now applause. <laughs> Thank you also. Thank you also to UBINET, the Union, KVMR, KNCO, NCTV, and our audience for your excellent questions and courtesy. I'd like to welcome Jihada back to the podium to close the program with some pertinent information about upcoming events. Thank you for your excellent questions and courtesy during this event's presentation. Next week, same time, same place, the League of Women Voters will continue to vote education service, I mean, yeah, education service and participation for the upcoming election with pros and cons presentation for the 11th ballot measures. As an, as an added bonus, Nevada Union Debate Club members will be debating two of the more Continuous propositions. Join us here at Rose Center at 7 p.m. next Thursday, October 4th, for the presentation. For the latest information on the upcoming election, stay tuned to our local media outlets. Visit our website, lwvwnc.org, and be sure to follow us on social media, lwvwnc. Have a great night, everyone.